All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I woke up this morning uh, with a lot to do and uh, it felt super weird. And so I'm on drugs. If, if this if this is if I say anything crazy, it's because of the day quill and various other <laughs> remedies that I'm <laughs> that I'm on. But I'm excited I, I, to uh, bank a couple podcasts uh, for Thanksgiving and talk, especially to Megan McArdle. She's a Washington Post columnist and the author of The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Megan McArdle, welcome back to the news. Matt Lewis, thanks for having me. Always great to talk with you. Thanks for taking time during your Thanksgiving week. And I guess we should start uh, with Elon Musk, Twitter, and his decision to bring Donald Trump, or at least to invite him back on the platform. Uh, what should we make of this? Uh I think Elon Musk is, I think this is actually kind of what he came back for. Like the, the CIA agent who's dragged out of, out of retirement for just one job, right? I think he really did decide to do this because of the bans and specifically because, because Twitter decided to ban the Babylon B for making a trans joke about uh, Rich. I believe that this was why they were banned. Readers should check this or listeners should check this. But I believe that it was a joke about uh, Rachel Levine, um, the Surgeon General. Uh, But again, check that. Anyway, uh, you know, that was the point at which he starts kind of making his public speculations about how um, he should take over Twitter, et cetera. And then, you know, what I think started maybe as a joke turned into less of a joke. The joke maybe went a little too far. And then a court like you know, made him actually go through with his joke. Uh, And so I think he wasn't entirely prepared to run the company as we've seen. I like, I don't know if you've been following this. It's insane. It's like the, the Mongols are pillaging um, every, you know, all the villagers are running around screaming. No, no. Um, Something like 75% of the um, workforce has already left and it might go up to like 80% or 90%. Um, and so that part, I don't think he planned, but the part I do think he planned was that he was going to reverse bans. Um, it's been interesting because you've also seen him rediscovering some of the reasons for things like shadow banning that conservatives have been complaining about. Uh, and shadow banning is basically, they don't delete, they don't actually ban your account. What they do is make it hard for other people to find your account or find your tweets. They de-emphasize them in the algorithm. Conservatives have been complaining about this forever. Elon Musk complained about it, I believe, um, but certainly more broadly complained about the the Twitter's excessively harsh banning policies, and has now come back and said, "You're guaranteed like you have the, you have freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. We're not going to amplify you know, yeah. hateful and terrible content." Um, but I think that he thought that the the bans were erring too much on the side of liberalism, too much on the side of suppressing speech. I agree with Elon Musk about that, um, that they had chosen a team and then they were consistently surprised when conservatives didn't like it. Um, and were also unable to see the ways in which they were really hurting themselves. Like Twitter banning the Hunter Biden laptop story, which has turned out, you know, CBS has verified it. New York Times seems to have verified it. Uh, the FBI seems pretty convinced it's true. Um, for Twitter, with its zero expertise in national security matters or forensic, you know, computing, um, to declare that fake news, I think speaks to a big problem that ultimately I don't think where I disagree with conservatives is conservatives are convinced that this really, really helps Democrats a lot in elections. And I actually think it hurts them because I think it means that they all live in this weird bubble and they have no yeah. idea what's going on outside of it. Um but that said, you know, I think that this was this was the moment of destiny. It has now occurred. Oddly quiet, actually, in part because like he's now got an interest in Truth Social, right? He's now got um, it's mostly, as far as I can see, allowing us to see his old tweets. I haven't actually. Let me go. You know, I have not checked out President Trump Trumpian Twitter. So I don't know. See. I thought he was not tweeting anything. He's just sending truths. Yeah, I, it's also like my impression, but I haven't actually looked. So, and I heard that there was some, and I, you know, again, check me on this. I can't verify this, but I heard that there was some contractual, contractual 
thing. <laughs> Again, I'm on a lot of drugs, people. Um, <laughs> I heard that Trump couldn't tweet until like 10 hours after he posted something on Truth Social, even if he wanted to, that he oh, was obliged to give them first dibs. Well, the last tweet on his account is um, January 8th, 2021. To all those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. Uh, so speaking of Trump and Elon Musk, and I'll throw in Kanye West, although he's an entertainer, um, so I give him a little more latitude. But it is interesting to me that that it seems like there are all these people in American life who um, who are basically trolls. And, you know, Elon Musk, you were talking about how he sort of bought Twitter on a whim or accidentally, you know, and then he's been posting. He, he did allowing Donald Trump back on the platform wasn't some deeply thought through thing. Apparently it was like a Twitter poll that, that he conducted and, and, and Trump narrowly won this Twitter poll. Um, and then I don't know if you saw this, but Elon Musk tweeted this very, I don't know, like sort of uh, graphic um, uh, meme uh, of, 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 of a, of a, of a woman <laughs> and, and a man. I was it Jesus. I'm not even sure. I thought it was like sacrilegious, but in any event, it was basically saying that Trump, was you know, praying for uh, to not be tempted to go back on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this meme. I, I'm not. No. I don't want to describe it even. But it was. My point is that like Elon Musk is not an adult. This is a, a billionaire in charge of like you know major projects in America, including Twitter, which is like this huge platform for our speech. And he is a child. And Donald Trump, the former president, is a child. And how did we get to a place like did it used to be that like was, you know, Rockefeller actually a child, but we didn't know it because Twitter didn't exist or or are are there no adults left anymore? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely some of that. I mean, many, many past rich men have been extremely badly behaved. Um, I think there used to be. But there has always been a kind of muddy, moneyed establishment that restrained some of that, that had its own codes of somewhat more restrained contact, uh, conduct. And then people would come and they would want to get into that because their wives would want to go to, uh, this is sexist, sorry, this is how rich people used to work back in the day. Um, they were almost all men. And, you know, the, the new money people their wives would want to like go to the fancy parties thrown, you know, by Mrs. Astor um, or the Vanderbilts or whoever was the, the reigning dom of society. And so he would quietly begin buying his way in. He would, Oh, excuse me. That was the dog. Um, <laughs> felt a, uh, a, a need to lick some parts that she could not reach while lying supine by my side. Um, and I should note that you were conducted. You're like, like Brian Wilson, you are lying in bed. <laughs> I'm lying in bed. Is it Brian Wilson, John Lennon, you know, whatever? But I, I no, applaud no. this. This is this is not my bed. This is the bed I work on. This is my work okay. Bed, I need a, 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 a. I need that. I need a work bed. I love the idea. I love the concept. And and people should go. Uh, I, I you know. Depending on how the video works out, we may post this at youtube.com slash Matt Lewis. So there's a chance you'll get to see an appearance. What's what's your dog's name? Sybil. Sybil. Okay. Um, yes, I've just seen that the Elon Musk meme. It's it's like mildly naughty. It's not terrible. Um, well, no, but 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 let me ask you: um, Was that supposed to be Jesus praying to avoid the temptation no, of a woman? I think that's a monk. A monk. Okay, still sacrilegious in my book, but but the message is that Trump yes. is going to have to pray to avoid the, the the that Twitter is a vixen that he will be tempted by and he will not be able to muster the uh, uh, self control to avoid going on Twitter. Yes, I think that is the that is definitely the implication. Um, yeah, this is it's a uh, yeah this is just a comic about. I presumably a monk. Um, oh, it's a, it's from a series of prints illustrating poems by 17th century writer Jean de La Fontaine that included similar tales of voyeurism, bigotry, and lust. Well, I think we've summed up Twitter right there. 
Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I like I. I think it is interesting how childishly they are both behaving, but you know, I will say this: someone at Politico had a great story the other day, just pointing out that Donald Trump doesn't really seem to be having fun anymore. Yes, that's right? true. And like, and that's a big thing. I it. think the 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 um the sense that he was having fun was a was a very attractive quality about him in 2016. Yep. Yeah, and it's now joyless and angry. And whereas Elon Musk is clearly still having fun, right? He's still enjoying this. I think Elon Musk understands he's gotten himself into a really, to an extent, I don't think a lot of people are clear on. He is extremely highly leveraged. And the value of the stock that he's using as collateral for all those deals is rapidly declining. Like he's actually, this, this Twitter acquisition has put him in a pretty perilous place. Um, and he's just clearly kind of like YOLOing his way through it. You know, if the entire house of cards comes crashing down, he's going to go out laughing, uh, which I admire, regardless of what else you think of him. It, it has a, a, a sort of undaunted courage that, uh, that I, I consider a virtue. Um, and or he's crazy, but I think, uh, I think he, he knows what the risks are and has just decided to, um, to, to whistle while he works. Well, I do. There is a thing that I like, which is um, if you get into a position where you're in a you're in a bad spot and it, instead of being pessimistic and, and, and hand wringing, um, make the best of it and have some fun like that part I admire. What I don't like is this kind of nihilistic attitude that I think is pervasive now, or at least maybe it's probably nut picking, but I see it. And the highest echelons of business and politics, of people who are enjoying watching it all burn, and and they don't seem to have any responsibility or sense of responsibility for the the good of the party or the good of the country. Um, they're uh, they're like they're they're like uh, enjoying this this craziness, and I think it's it's destructive. So the uh, the burn it all down caucus is terrible, right? They. And, and the thing that they always say is just so obviously false. I don't even know how a sensible, an apparently sensible human being who holds a job could say this. It's like, well, it can't really get any worse. Like, yes. have you seen Somalia? Yes, yeah. it can definitely. Have you seen yeah. the Soviet Union? Have you been reading some news articles about China? It can definitely get worse. Um, regardless of what your personal travails are, regardless of how angry you are about woke capital, or capitalism, or whatever it is that you think. What's is... so bad? What is, I, I want to know what's so bad about America. I mean, <clears throat> granted, I'm sure I'm privileged. Uh, I'm sitting in a nice, warm house right now, uh, talking to somebody who's fascinating, but is you know, I'm I'm sitting in West Virginia. I assume you're sitting in in, in Washington D.C. I am sitting in Washington um, D.C. I got some coffee here. I'm going to have Thanksgiving. I've got a beautiful wife. We just celebrated our anniversary. Um, Mazel tov. Thank you. So, uh, what's the secret? The secret is um, lots of coffee. Um, I, you know what I think? Um, I think one of the secrets is, and you know, knock on wood, there, there, but for the grace of God, go I kind of thing. But like, I, I think one of the secrets to staying married is um, is is not getting divorced. You know what I mean? That's a really good one. That that like, works. It's, it's very profound, right? It's simple. Just uh, we're just not going to do that. So a hundred percent of the couples who don't get divorced stay married. Yeah, I think that there's a real correlation there. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost it, scientific. I know it. I know a surefire way not to end up in foreclosure. Don't have a mortgage. Yes. Yes. Hundred percent um, of people in foreclosure have mortgages. Yeah. Uh, but we, you know, we, we could do a whole thing on marriage sometime, but, but let me stay with where you're at right now, which I think is gratitude, right? This is Thanksgiving week when we're recording this. These people, and I'm, gonna, I'm actually writing a column about this, so it's fresh on my mind. And, you know, our mutual friend Jonah Goldberg wrote a book about, about it, uh, uh, you know, talk, where he talks about the miracle. Like, 
it is a miracle. This liberal democracy is a miracle. The fact that we have vaccines is a miracle. The fact that I can uh, leave my house and not be uh, murdered by a gang uh, or stopped by some rogue police officer, uh, you know, when I stop at a four-way stop and, and, and they shake me down and, and mug me or something. Like, we live in a pretty amazing time. It is a miracle. And I just don't think people on the left or the right are really appreciative of what we have. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it, honestly, is just that people are getting older, right? And like, I don't know about you, but like everything was better when I was 23. And, uh, you know, I I now like, I a few weeks ago, I was fine. I was at an event. I got in a car and, and I called an Uber to go home. I got out of the Uber and I had done something to my back. <laughs> like sitting in a car, no idea what. So... I actually really do think that that's part of it is like we we always if you think about the stories that America tells about various decades, uh, Yuval Levin has pointed out it's always the story of the boomers, right? The 50s is this time of ease and low anxiety and prosperity because that's when those the boomers were kids. And like when you're a little kid, even if your parents are freaking out and like everything's terrible unless it goes stuff goes really really wrong you don't know like i now yeah. know that my mother and father were freaking out about money basically constantly throughout my childhood but like i had no idea i just selfishly asked them for stuff that like we couldn't afford all the time <laughs> and i'm now so i'm like now that i know how what yeah. it's like to be worried about money kids, I, I, speaking of, of thanksgiving and, and gratefulness kids tend not to be that yes it's, they it's, tend it's not to be and that I, we have to take that into consideration. It's a, we have to cultivate that. Yeah. Um, and and so then, you know, the 60s are their tumultuous youth when everything is great, all the music's fantastic, etc. And then the 70s are the grim, you know, the grim period because like they're they're in their 30s now and like they're a little now they're starting to get anxious and like the economy is not so great and and then their 40s they hit their peak earnings years, it's the 80s morning in America, right? That whole arc. And now they're on social security and they don't like it. Um, which fair enough. Um, that is a really, so this is Yuval Levin. This is a really Yuval interesting Levin. insight. I, 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 I'm afraid I'm not that smart. I don't have good insights like that. I have Yuval's insights, uh, like, very wise. And it's not original to him to say that everything's about the boomers, but I've never heard it put quite this way before, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think so what, what happens when they die? Then do we finally, <laughs> can we finally well, move we on? I, but I think what's now happening is the millennials and the Zoomers are just recapturing that arc. Like Gen X is just being told to shut the hell up. What do we know? Um, and by the way, quite a lot, young man. Thank you very much. I really, I you know, like if the post would let me, I would start a TikTok called Ask the Ask a uh, an old person, and it would just be like explaining that all of the things that young people think are like their unique problems that no one has ever had before uh, is actually the same problem that everyone has had before. Um, so, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that would... So that I, have would to, I have to say one thing that's really been um, rewarding to me is that my, you know, we moved to West Virginia. My wife's grandfather is 100 years old and we spend wow. a lot of time with him and he's very sharp. But what's really great is... Like I was just talking to my my kids about uh, for some reason the song Johnny Be Good came came uh -huh. up or came on, and I was saying like yeah, Gramps was like thirty eight years old when this song came out. I, I'd have to do the math, but he was like in his thirties when this song wow. came out. Um, and then it's like you know we just had lunch with him the other day, and you know he's he's I wouldn't normally say this, but he was cool with it. Uh, but it was like um, it was something to the effect of. He was saying, like, when you get to be my age, you'll have to, this will be a problem for you, too. Oh, I know what it was, shrinking. He's, by the way, I don't have three inches to shrink, but he has shrunk three inches in the last decade. You would be surprised. Um, Apparently, you can find the inches even if you don't start out with that many. <laughs> like, he has shrunk three inches. And it's apparently, I didn't know this, he was telling me it's, it's all, like, in the gut. You know, it's not your, he says his legs are the same length they always were. He's wearing the yeah. same pants. It's but it's, it's in the upper column, body. Yeah, your spinal column like compresses. Yeah. And so he was bringing that up. And I said, uh, when did this when did this start? And he's like, probably in my 90s. And then I, he's like, y y so you should watch out. And I said, OK, 
So in 45, you know, 40 years or something, I'll have to work. And so that really made me feel good that I'm young compared to him. I am like a baby. I've got a lot of time left if I make it to 100. He's an outlier, though. <laughs> I have to <warn> you. <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe maybe medical science will make us both. Like my grandmother lived to 100 and 102, 103. I think uh, she died in 2019. She was born in 1950, so 104. Wow. Um, yeah, but it was not. It was not. I would not have wanted to live those last yeah. two years. They were. They were rough. She didn't. You know. She had like a. She didn't really recognize us at the end, and it was sad. But that is. Um, but so you know, if you could be sharp, that would be great, right? Yeah. I would Gramps is sharp. That, but, Gramps um, is sharp. But uh, I don't know. Maybe medical science will get us there. I hope. <laughs> maybe. Meantime, I'm not sure I how I got us here nuts. at this yes. point in the conversation. I know we, we were talking about uh, uh, Thanksgiving. and it, well, Yeah, that's what it is, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know if we want to, to to sort of close out not our conversation, but this part of our conversation. But, yeah, I you think know, it's Thanksgiving. I think, I think part of it, right, is that social media just forces us to spend all of our time thinking about our arguments with other people, especially if you're on Twitter, right? Which is a very journalist medium, right? Much more even than when I was blogging. It's like, because it's constant, it never goes away. There's always someone you disagree with to argue with. And so it focuses you on the ways in which they're trying to lower your status, right? You can tell so much of politics through just a kind of like monkey status seeking lens. I want that, like, the blue check mark is a prime example. Now there yeah. are other people who can buy that check mark. But like, I didn't even, I, I don't care about my blue check mark. I mean, I might if someone was impersonating me really effectively, but it would be hard to impersonate me really effectively. Who else has this combination of completely banal observations and obsession with vintage foodstuffs and bull mastiffs? Like, people who else know has a work bed? Who else has a work bed? <laughs> Um, well, my, my office started as this bare bedroom and I discovered I liked working on a bed. So I love it. I love um, it. but the other thing but, too is, is comparison, right? It's like Instagram, you know, we're seeing someone who's on a better vacation than us and they're only putting up their best picture, you know? And, and so we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people, you know, or they were on Morning Joe this morning and I wasn't. And so they tweeted a video of that out and they're only putting the best stuff that they have and their yeah, best there's vacation. A, there's a passage that I quoted um, in my book, which was the reason that we um, think so little of ourselves is that we're comparing our behind the scenes with someone else's highlight reel. Yeah. Right. Like someone tells you even even before social media and social media. Well, has made I'm sorry to interrupt, work. Megan. It, my computer says that you were offline. Are you seeing this? Uh, no. Yeah, it says you're offline, but I assume that you're still. Are you? Are you still? When you talk, are you still seeing like the when the I talk? Do lines? I see, yeah, I still see. Uh, I still see like the squigglies. Not okay. nearly as big as yours. I'm like, am I? Should That's I be weird. closer to the mic? But um, well, I think what we can do. I think we could just power through because I. I think that if, if it's recording your stuff on your end and my stuff on my end, yeah, theoretically, be, it will blend it together, together, good Lord willing. But it does concern me that it says offline. Right. <laughs> but so, you know, even before social media, you think about someone tells you their, about their vacation and you ask and they're like, oh, it was amazing. We went, oh, we saw this cool volcano and we stayed in these little grass huts and the pool, there was a pool, right? Like you just walk straight out your door into the pool and we rode catamaran at, at sunset and it was amazing and blah, 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 right? And they don't tell you. And my husband and I had a three hour fight on the airplane because like he forgot the, the bag that had my books in it. So I just had to sit there on the airplane watching the stupid movie that I've already seen. And then on day two, uh, my husband got a stomach flu. And so I basically just sat around outside the room and like actually spent most of the morning combing the local drugstores to buy a modium, right? Like <laughs> you don't, none of that gets into the casual description. If you have a really good friend, you might hear the real blow by blow. Yes. 
But for a normal person, they're just going to tell you the highlight reel because, like, in fact, they probably correctly assume you do not want to hear about their husband's diarrhea, right? Like, this is just something that we share with our only the people we we love the most. Yeah. Um, and so we're constantly in this sense of thinking that we must be, you know, less fun and worse than everyone else. Um, yeah. And it makes us forget that. Um, uh, that in fact, most of us have it pretty good. I mean, certainly compared to historical humans, if you're over the age of 30, congratulations, you won the historical lottery because the average life expectancy of a forager um, back in the Paleolithic was in their 30s. So if you're older than that, you're already like, you're living on, you're living on bonus time. Um, Absolutely. And my, so my dad, my dad uh, had an appendicitis when he was like a teenager and I haven't looked this up, but he told me that if he had been born like 10 years earlier, he would have died that, you know, that, that they didn't have the medicine for it or the treatment for it. I'd have to, I need to independently verify that, but, but, but so whether that's ruptured, specifically true or not, that sort of thing is, is true. If it had perforated before they pulled it out, that is probably true. He would have died because you know, like a massive septic infection from a perforated imp- appendix, not very survivable. Which uh, means I wouldn't be sitting here, of course. Yeah, I was, um, my mother told me that if it weren't for penicillin, I'd be deaf because I had so many uh, ear infections as a kid that I perforated my eardrum once. Um, I have no memory of this. I'm sure it was extremely painful and hard on my mom. Mm. But um, but yeah, you know, I also, I, there's this, like, there's all of these gratitude hacks and they sound so hokey and they also completely work. Um, so one that I read, um, I don't even remember where it was in some religious magazine, but they were like, when you're having trouble, right. If, if you have to, like, you're having, having to do an arduous walk or carry something heavy up the stairs, or you just like, you're exhausted and you need to clean your house or whatever. Like, try thanking God for making you strong enough to do this. Like, and you know what? It totally works. It also sounds Absolutely. like something that you would be like in a Chinese fortune wrapper, right? Um, you know, keeping a gratitude journal. It actually works. It makes people happier. It really does. Um, and this is the funny thing is like with gratitude, gratitude makes us happier. And we are choosing not to use this tool because it feels lame because it, because we don't want to let go of our anger. We would rather be angry than happy. And I find that extremely interesting. And now like the defense of that, that like Ezra Klein once made, for example, is that if people just were grateful for what they had, tried to make the best of their own life, instead of fo- focusing on how angry they are about X, Y, or Z external condition, then nothing would change and everything would be bad. And I think, to some extent, that's correct, right? There is a place in the world for righteous anger. But I think that that's not actually how a lot of us are using anger. If you see all of the amount of anger on Twitter, to bring it back to the, the initial topic of that we started with, um, this is not anger that's about accomplishing anything. I mean, the thing it is accomplishing is getting other people angry on Twitter. The real world translation of that is basically nothing. Because getting angry on Twitter feels like you've done something. So like, yes, you're activating people, but you're activating people to do more of this useless activity. And I think that's the one downside. The other side, though, is that I think it's addictive. Oh, yeah, totally. I think, you know, there is a person that I follow who I used to know in real life. I will not give more details than that. They are, except to say that they are a professional writer at a major place. And when I knew this person, which is not very well, but well enough, um, they they know someone that I know very well. They I, like I've had dinner with them. They seem like a pretty nice human being. And actually, weirdly, not all that political. And then the, I watched The Great Awakening and The Great Awakening. I do not object to social justice is good. Fighting racism is good. Fighting sexism is good. Those things are all good. But the way I watched it play out was that this person started aggressively bullying younger writers and like PR people who pitched them 
right? Or actually PR people who just tweeted, who made tweets that they considered insufficiently sensitive to some issue or the other. Never up. Never once saw this person like, you know, tweeting their boss being like, how dare you? Right? Always down. And it just seemed like, well, the cause might be good. The way you're going about it is obnoxious. Because I mean, like hectoring some hapless PR drone. It's not like the social media manager for, I don't know, let us say Acme piping can go back and be like, this writer is angry. We're changing corporate policy, right? All they can do is helplessly attempt to placate the person that they unwittingly enraged. Um, and I, I thought like, no, this is just bullying because you enjoy bullying someone, right? The, yep. the cause is an excuse but that's not what's going on here because this is about the most ineffective way to pursue actual change ever. And so I thought, what is, was this person always like this? Did this person always want to bully people less powerful than them? And they just, I didn't know because they didn't have the technology and the, uh, and the, and the, the, the excuse mm -hmm. or did, did and then you can know? use, then you can also simultaneously be a bully and a hero. Yes, because you're doing yes. it for the for the you know, for the good cause. And if you talk to parents uh, in certain schools, they will tell you that what they think has happened is that all of the anti-bullying initiatives um, have tamped down old kinds of bullying. Right. So it, it really is true. And this is great news that there is much less bullying of kids for like sexual identity, gender nonconformism, et cetera. But there is, but that the same kids are now have now turned into like the ultra woke kid who now bullies the other kids in their class yeah. this way. Right. I mean, who I think you, you know, human nature, there's a part of human nature that wants power and dominance. And yeah. And uh, it's like almost like a whack-a-mole. You know, you push you push one side down and then the other side pops up. Yeah. And so um, the question I have is like, was this person always this way and Twitter just revealed it? Or does Twitter make us that way? And I think there's at least some element of Twitter making us this way, which is that I think um, a psychiatrist of my experience, psychologist of my experience who specializes in drug addiction, um, was saying that he thinks that the behavior you see on Twitter is very reminiscent of drug addiction. And it's, you know, the same kind of thing, actually. It's like dopamine. Like mm -hmm. hitting that dopamine, hitting those dopamine receptors, right? Is that like rage, when we're flooded with rage, it suppresses all sorts of other things like anxiety, like all sorts of other unpleasant emotions, um, anxiety and fear, right? All it's this, it's great. It's this huge rush of just powerful, um, a bit like taking cocaine. And the problem is that like, as with other stimulants, it's addictive. And if you do too much of it, it ruins your life. And so I do think that Twitter is at least making this worse. Now, I do think that like people did have different tendencies. Um, I, I think there are a lot of people I know who just never wanted to bully anyone else on Twitter and they don't. Um, yeah. But I think Twitter can feed it and take what is, you know, like a kind of small, understandable human failing and magnify it into something really kind of repulsive. Totally. I think it's like alcohol, you know? Yeah. It's like anything else. It's it, what Homer Simpson say, the cause of and the solution to all of our problems. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. Which um, is why I think I, just I, in general, news too contributes to this, right? News, the news media, what, if it believes it leads, um, the news media is always giving us negative information problems. And um, I understand why that happens, but I think that. No, it's not you. It's You're not, in the media too. It's them. It's our, it's our, it's oh, our, yeah, I blame it's our, those it's MSM listeners. elites, the, the, the media elites, not us, not you it's and not, me. No, it's not the media elites. It's, it's the media elites are providing what people click on and watch. If you guys would watch heartwarming stories about puppies saving kittens from rivers, we would just do nothing but that. But you don't do that. You want to know about, about how, like, yeah, about how people are transing your kids and how, like systemic racism is going to destroy America and how like, you know, capitalism, all the capitalists are stealing all the money um, so that they can, so that the poor people will die and they can be used as mulch on their diamond farms. 
Um, like you guys want those stories. That is they do. They that's have- true. When I was uh, when I first started off as a blogger, and um, back so when you were blogging, you'd write five to ten things a day. So you know, it, it was a different, just a different strategy. Um, and then also, we didn't have at least I didn't have a, a way to measure as 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 accurately what was uh, what was popping and what wasn't. And I I would do stuff where like. I'm going to go hang out with Stephen Moore. I didn't do this, but like, here's an example. I'm just going to go hang out with Stephen Moore, head of the club for growth for the yeah. day. And I'm just going to write about where he's from and what inspires him. And, or it might be like his, his, you know, his favorite albums. I'll talk to like Chuck Todd and Chris Saliza and different people and find out who they think is going to win the Super Bowl or something like that. And nobody reads those things. Nobody cares. Yeah. And I, I tried to write things like that and, and nobody reads them. It just doesn't happen. I think it's in that, that I think I'm just moving my mic to, cause, cause I'm looking at your, your big, uh, variants and my tiny little, we have, uh, for people who can't see, obviously we have little things that like measure how much sound you're getting. And I mm. seem to be getting a lot less sound than Matt. So I'm like, Am I well, going to sound like I'm in the next standing in the next room? No, no, no. So first of all, remember, we may not even be recording. It's unclear to me. And, and that's why we probably should wrap it up soon. Just I don't want to waste too much of your time in case it's not. But the other thing is, through the miracle of technology, theoretically, it will uh, Zencaster will take our audio huh, and, okay. and boost whoever needs to be boosted and, and level it out. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, By the way, are you using a Yeti? Yeah. Okay, so let's go even more inside baseball here. I I had a Yeti. It was operating fine. Yeti Blue. It's got to be like the most yep. popular podcast mic for like a USB port in America. And then um, Apple did an update, and now I can't get my computer to recognize them. It, it, it doesn't even exist, no matter what I do. I restart uh-huh. the computer. I plug in the mic again. It won't even recognize that it exists. I mean, I'm. When did you do the update? It was like two weeks ago, and, I, and now I had to buy a new mic because <laughs> wow. I literally I couldn't get it through. I did everything. Okay, what version of of Mac OS are you on? Oh, I the latest. I have a brand new Mac. I could look in my little Apple icon up here, but I'm very computer. I mean, I'm pretty up to date, but. But apparently this happens. I mean, I just uh, I've Googled around and it's not like everyone in America that has a Yeti had this happen right now. But this is a problem that has over the last year or two manifested for different people. I have no idea why. If you're listening out there and you know what is going on, let me know. I know this is not riveting podcast information, but you will be doing me a big favor. Drop me a line. So, Well, I just realized that I am now behind one generation on software for some reason. It's not updated. So now I'm going to have to go uh, update and like, no, do don't I? And then, well, no, but you don't want to. I can't. I can't admit that I'm not updated on a podcast and then be like hackers. Megan's not updated. Oh. You should totally try to. Yeah. So. But if you update, um, you may lose your Yeti mic. And if that happens, let me know. I'll tell you what mic to get. Okay. I will, I will take you up on that. Um, yeah. So gratitude, Twitter, um, rage yes. news. I mean, here's the thing is in print, people would read those stories, right? Well, well we, think people we would wouldn't read know. Stories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, that is also a problem that there was a lot of stuff that was written for other journalists, but yeah, but yeah, the, 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 the down, I will say the downside of the internet is that it has gotten easier to find out exactly what readers like. And often it was not what we thought they liked. Um, it turns out that like kind of national political reporting, you no, know, people really care about it when something's happening, but like the day to day stuff, not people are not that interested. The, the culture stuff, all that people, not that interested. What people are really interested in was like sports crosswords and the comics. That was what was keeping newspapers going in the classified <laughs> ads. Um, I mean, now we're kind of rebuilding, and it's it's really interesting to watch from inside of a newspaper how you rebuild when you're not you're not the one place that everyone right that everyone in your area is going to get all their news for the day. Right, it used to be that like we had to be a comprehensive news source 
because it was us and the TV news and that was going to be it. Mm -hmm. That was going to be all the news anyone got. And now we're one piece of a of a, a giant buffet and how that is changing the business is just fascinating. Totally. To well, I've also had to just like, okay, so um, Ron Sheldon, who wrote um, Bull Durham, writer, director of, of the great movie Bull Durham and others, I had him on the podcast, you know, a month or two ago. And if I had, it's weird, but if I had like done the interview and transcribed it or written it and put it up on my, you know, the Daily Beast, let's say, I, I doubt, number one, I doubt if they would have greenlit it. Um, and, and, and partly because they have other people who do that sort of entertainment stuff. But even if they had, I, I don't think it would have performed that well. And so I've now the, the things that I want to do that I'm interested in, the sort of pet projects, the vanity projects for me, I do on my podcast. And then the column is pretty much politics. Yeah. And because that's what the, that's what the masses want and, well, and what they want. That project, if you're a yeah. brand is what they get. So you're, you're a vanity project for me too. I, I'm sure I'm a you, you project for me, Frank, you would drive a lot of traffic, I'm sure, but this is fun. I'm glad we get to do this. And, um, I want, you know, I wanted to talk to you. We'll have to have you back because oh. I don't even know if we're recording, but I wanted to talk to you about, about crypto and have you explain it to me. I wanted to uh, lament being a Gen Xer and talk about how for some weird reason, Gen X is very Republican now. And, um, we're 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 getting old, dude. It's Never. a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like, how old are you? Can I am 48. 48 years yeah. old. So I'm going to turn 50 in January. So we're very close to the same age. Um, and yeah, we're getting old. I'm going to be eligible for the AARP next year. My church has something called 55 Alive, which I think is a little offensive because it's almost like, <laughs> they're surprised that you're still alive at 55 but literally it's it's called 55 alive and and you can join it when you're 55 and my son was just busting my chops about being eligible soon to join this like apparently senior it's like a basically being a senior citizen or something and what does 55 alive do do they like I, you know they go they... on hikes and stuff i don't know they go hiking <laughs> better get it out before you just topple <laughs> um yeah, my church is just geriatric, so it's like it's and also since the pandemic has been like it's it's very small. It's like it's sad. I'm not sure I'm not sure our parish is gonna survive. But well the beauty of being in West Virginia is nobody cares about COVID. Nobody wears masks or so you know, they're gonna keep meeting. Uh some of them, you know, maybe shouldn't have been maybe should have been wearing masks, but uh we'll keep we'll keep meeting. Trust me. Well, the the funny thing about my church, it's the um, the oldest historically black church in D.C. And I should say that I don't go there every Sunday. I, I kind of I'm like, oh, I need to get groceries there. I will, I will just shop parishes, which you're not really <laughs> supposed to do. But I've heard of I've heard of cafeteria Catholics, but this is ridiculous. Well, look, you know, I'm just there for the real presence. Right. Like and the real presence is happening anywhere I am. Right. Uh, anywhere point. I go to mass. So. Um, but you know, I do frequently go and it's, um, they took COVID extremely seriously. Um, and they have like plexiglass, um, up and for a long time, I think it's coming back. Like, I think it's slowly coming back where there's more people in the pews and so forth. But before COVID, um, I had a friend visiting from France and I took him there. And afterwards, and he was a gospel mass and it was, and, and he, I said, what did you think? And he said, well, I liked it, except that they stopped mass in the middle and had coffee hour, by which he meant, you know, do you know, Catholics stop and give each other the sign of peace in, in the middle of services. So um, <laughs> what my church used to do, they don't do this now. They would literally all get into the aisles and everyone there would hug every other person in the congregation. It was just a madhouse. That's it, great. It was great. It took yeah. 20 minutes. That's <laughs> it awesome. was wonderful. Um, and like, I only discovered this because it's literally the nearest Catholic church to my house. And um, and it's great, but uh, they don't do that anymore. It makes me a little sad. That is really, that is a shame. You know, I just, I was just at the- uh, Dave, twinkle the thing, jazz hands. <laughs> I was just at the American Enterprise Institute's dinner honoring Arthur yeah. Brooks. And were you there? I missed it, unfortunately. I was in London. 
but, so he um, spoke, of course, and you know he talked about the things that bring us joy and happiness, and you know faith, family, meaningful work, community. I dare say thankfulness, gratefulness. I'm sure is on the list. Gratitude works so well, guys. Seriously, if I leave you with nothing, is like next time you don't have to believe in God, you can just like thank Providence. Um, but next time you're doing something that's just unpleasant, try being thankful that, that you are, you have been given what it takes. Cause like, I see this, you know, the thing that drove it home to me is like, my parents are getting older and they're struggling with doing things that are used, that are easy for me and used to be easy for them, like standing up and other things. And I suddenly thought like, I'm not going to be this strong forever. And I should, and you know, I'm sad already at the amount of strength and like healthiness that I've lost, but I should be grateful for the fact that I'm still, you know, I can still go walk 10 miles. I can still go like and carry heavy things and do all that stuff and I should do more of it and I should be glad when I'm doing it even when it's raining and I'm kind of annoyed um and so I, I started that and it has actually really changed my outlook um gratitude journals really work they feel like a third grade homework assignment but they really <laughs> work because it focuses you on the good things and you are not going to have so many you know we all hope that we will live to 100 like gramps and be healthy every one of those days and die in our sleep after an amazing birthday feast. Um, but we don't all get that. So just, you know, be grateful for what you have now. There's no discount. You get no, you're not going to get a discount from the universe. You're not going to get a rebate for all of the days you spent being miserable and unhappy when you did not have to, when there was not something so terrible that like, of course, you were immediately riven by grief, such as the death of a close loved one. All of the days that you spent making yourself mad, all you got from that is that you were mad and you had an unpleasant day and you can decide to change that. That's actually under your control is to decide to not engage so much with the negativity, to not look for relief from your anxiety through getting mad and instead look for relief from your anxiety by remembering that even though you're worried about stuff, things are actually pretty good. And the worst downside for you as a healthy person, a hopefully healthy person living in a Western democracy is not that bad. And that's that's pretty great. Focus on I that. love it. Amen. Well, I'm grateful that you were here, that you took time. And how can people who want to follow you on Twitter or read your stuff, how could they do that? Uh, at the Washington Post. Um, I am Megan McArdle. Last name is spelled M-C-A-R-D-L-E. First name is M-E-G-A-N. I say this because no one knows how to spell my name. Although misspellings, I think if you Google them, will probably get you close to where I am. But just Google my name in Washington Post. That's where all my columns are. They come out two to four times a week. Um, not four this week. It is a, a holiday. Um, and you can see me on Twitter at Asymmetric Info, uh, where I am trying not to be as negative as I used to be. And also trying to engage less in general because it felt like this weird hobby that was juggling live hand grenades. And I have, I'm trying to put my, my energy into more positive and rewarding things. I love it. All right. Megan McArdle, thank you for coming back on Thanks the Thanks for having me.